Hi, I'm Ria and I'm a AWS solutions architect that works exclusively with games customers. What that means is I help support them on their cloud journey and a big part of that is game servers. So today I want to go over the options when it comes to game servers on AWS and how you might pick between them. But first, it's important to have an idea of what the industry challenges are. So with games, uh, they're very unpredictable when it comes to player numbers. So some games have huge player bases and some games have smaller player bases, but PR and uh, certain events like holidays can, make, can mean that the um, player base varies quite wildly. <laughs> and that means that you have to scale up and scale down. And if you're really lucky, then you get to scale up to hundreds of millions of players and still keep it at the lowest cost possible. There's also security. So online games are quite often the targets of DDoS attacks, and that can be against either a specific player or a game as a whole. So security is very, very important to games customers as well. And finally, there's a level of player expectation. If you buy an online game, the minimum that you would like is to be able to connect and play that game. And what that means is if you're playing with multiple people in a group and one person can't connect, the whole group may just leave the game altogether and go play something else, which obviously isn't the best idea. So game server architecture traditionally looks a little bit like this. So you have the game server up at the top and the game clients down at the bottom. And the game client is how the players connect to the game. So it could be a computer, it could be a console, it could be your mobile phone and you send game actions up to the game server and the game server takes in those actions and then communicates the game state back down to the game client. And this pattern is called um, server authoritative architecture and it's very important for multiple reasons. One of which being that if the game client is the single source of truth, that means that the player on that individual game client has a much lower latency than all of the other players and all the other game clients because everything is happening on their machine. There's also a element of stopping cheating. So if the game client is the single source of truth and is making decisions about the game state, it's one step closer to the player, which means that they could make decisions for the entire game state that would affect every other player on the game. So when it comes to options on AWS, you have Multitude. The first one that we're going to cover is Amazon EC2, which is our compute offering. The second one is Amazon ECS and also Amazon EKS, which are our managed container offerings. And the final one is Amazon GameLift, which is for uh, managed server hosting just for games. And on the bottom, we can see the arrow that is uh, least opinionated to most opinionated. And what that means is as we get more opinionated, more towards the game lift side, we take more of the management of that service. So we do more of the patching, we do more of the orchestration, and that means you have less operational overhead, but it also means that there's slightly less flexibility with how you can deploy it. So different customers have different appetites for how uh, deep in they wanna get and how flexible they wanna get with deployment. So if we go straight to Amazon EC2, this architecture looks a lot more like traditional game server architecture than some of the other options. As you can see, you've got your game server there. That exists in an auto scaling group so that we can do that scaling that we talked about to hopefully hundreds of millions of players. And that's also spread across two availability zones. And that allows you to suffer some loss in the availability zone uh, without having everything go down. This only shows one region, but with all of the architecture that you're gonna to see today, you want to have multiple regions because um, you want to get your game as close to your players as possible to reduce as much latency as possible. So we're gonna to have to imagine this on multiple regions on a wider scale. There's also a, an element with EC2 and with every compute offering about right sizing. So traditionally, you would have uh, lots of game servers and lots of game sessions, which are instances of a single match with lots of players on them. You would have them all on your big game server. 
and your big instance. And that can be quite good because you can pack a lot of people onto one piece of compute, but it can be bad because you're increasing your blast radius. If that instance goes down or if that level of compute goes down, then that affects players on lots and lots of matches, which means it affects lots and lots of players. So you could also make the choice to use a smaller instance and have a fewer amount of matches, a fewer amount of sessions on that instance and limit the blast radius if something were to go wrong with that instance. We also have managed container game servers. So this, is, this diagram is specifically ECS, but you can also use EKS. With ECS, the clusters are region specific. So on a wider region basis, you would have multiple clusters with all of this architecture in it. And again, it can look a little bit similar. So we still have the auto scaling groups. We still have multiple availability zones, but we have the game servers in containers instead. Good thing about using containers is that you can pack up all of your dependencies into one unit so that you don't have to install them just straight on the EC2 instance, straight onto the compute. And it's also a smaller blast radius again. Usually you will have one game session per instance or one game server per instance. And what that means is um, each of these individual containers is a game server. With ECS, we have the concept of a task and a task is one or more containers. The only real time where you would want to use multiple containers is if you need a sidecar that will do something like monitoring that will run at exactly the same time as whatever's running on the initial container. When we look at GameLift, this is our managed game server offering. So it's made specifically for game servers and it's a lot more managed, which means that you give, the, uh, you give GameLift your game binary and you tell it how you want your fleets to run. And that means that you can um, make decisions about where you're deploying, but you don't actually have to do any of the orchestration around that. You also get other management tools with GameLift that we'll cover a little bit later. With this, it's important to remember that you can have multiple game server processes per instance. So it's not exactly like how the ECS worked before, or the containers worked before. We also have GameLift for containers, which we launched this year. That lets you run containers on GameLift, meaning that you have another level of management again. So this does look a little bit different from how we saw ECS and potentially EKS would work. So instead we have the concept of a container group and a container group has your game lift agent, which does some management and it also runs multiple server processes. So it's quite similar to traditional game lift in the fact that you can have multiple server processes on a single instance or on a single container. And here you can see that you also can have sidecars or auxiliary applications that you have access to running on your game. So we also have hybrid models. So a lot of our customers do run all of their game servers on AWS, but some, some customers have on-prem architecture as well. So in this example, you may have players across the world here, but you only have a data center in America. So that data center will cover those customers and those players, but the players across Europe and in Asia will have much higher latency. In which case you can burst into the cloud or you can use cloud just for those regions. And that may also mean that you don't want to manage your database anymore, for example. And so you could use something like DynamoDB, which is like a managed NoSQL database. And you can offload that to the cloud instead of running it on your data center and having to deal with all the patching of your data center. All of the um, options that we've discussed previously have hybrid options. So with GameLift, you have GameLift Anywhere, and you also have GameLift Fleet IQ, which means that you can run a mix of on-prem, but also EC2 instances still using GameLift. You can also use ECS and EKS Anywhere if you would like to do exactly the same thing. So a couple of our architecture diagrams have had a box that just said backend, game backend. And I thought I'd mention this because it's a very important component to running a game online. Although we're just talking about the servers at the moment, game backends make everything run behind the scenes. So they're responsible for the server orchestration, they're responsible for matchmaking, which is putting all your players on the right game matches in the right region, and logging 
and um, player data and game data as well. So GameLift will handle server orchestration for you. If you use GameLift FlexMatch, it will also handle that matchmaking, but you could have specific matchmaking needs, which mean that you want to make your own matchmaking solution, in which case you can use things like Lambdas. And a lot of our customers use DynamoDB specifically for player data and for game data. So those are the options that we've had so far and that we have at the moment. These are the considerations that I go through with my customers to decide whether they want to use EC2 or ECS or EKS. So there's four key parts of this. The first one is the game. You need to have a look at what type of game you're running and what are the requirements around that. So if you've got a short session based game with quicker matches, GameLift is ideal for that. That's what GameLift was designed to do. If you have a longer running game, like an MMO that needs an always online world, you could potentially use GameLift, but you may want to go more towards a long running EC2 instance. And if you have unique features around matchmaking, that also comes into play. More complex matchmaking algorithms, you may just want to create all yourself, which means that you want to use something else like Lambda or EC2 to host those. You also need to think about your players. So how many players do you have? How large is your player base? And where are those players? Because that determines where you're putting your servers, whether you need lots of them or little of them. And it also affects matchmaking because the more restrictive your matchmaking, the harder it is to find games. And so if you have a very, very small player base and you have very restrictive matchmaking rules with specific regions, it can mean that players might not even be able to get into a game at all. You also have team. And when I say team, I mean the team building the game, not necessarily the team playing the game. So you need to think about how large your team is, whether you have a lot of resources to be doing a lot of management and would just prefer to use EC2, or if you only have a few people to run all of your game servers, in which case a more managed option like ECS or GameLift could be perfect for that. And if there are any specific areas of expertise, I know some teams that absolutely love using containers, some teams absolutely love using Kubernetes, in which case you would use EKS and put your game servers on pods and nodes. And finally, resources. So you could have existing infrastructure and want to use a hybrid model, or you could have licenses for specific tooling that needs to integrate with the services, in which case I would interrogate that and have a look and see what matches. So I hope that was a good overview. That means that you can make those decisions yourself now. If you would like to learn a little bit more about what AWS does in the game space, we have a games blog. But also if you want to hear some more about what I've got to say about matchmaking, I've written a blog that is also available on the other QR code. Thank you.